Hey everyone, I'm John Lynn, the Founder and Chief Editor at Healthcare IT Today. We're excited to bring you another in our series of interviews with top leaders in health IT. And our guest today is Navaneeth Nair. He's Chief Product Officer at Infinix. Welcome, Navaneeth. Thank you for having me, John. It's Always to happy to talk to you. Yeah, I love your insights. Uh, you know, I'm such a fan of what you're doing, so excited to have you back in here. But the, for those that don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself and Infinix. Yeah, um, Navneet, I'm Chief Product Officer at Infinix. I've been with Infinix a little over seven years. Um, we are in healthcare revenue cycle. We've been um, working to solve the revenue cycle problem using technology and services. And, and what we see, we are, we are very excited about where the world is headed as kind of revenue cycle combined with AI and automation can produce in, in the future. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, AI agents are evolving really quick, like, and it's moving beyond simple automations to handling much more complex tasks on their own. Talk to me about what excites you most about this shift and how you're using it. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting about AI agents. So we actually coined the construct of agents three years ago. Okay. Um, I want to say I pre, pre-chat GPT to some <laughs> degree because we always yeah. thought that a lot of revenue cycle work would be done by digital agents. Mm-hmm. Um, and we always knew that combination of machine learning with automation would actually yield the best benefits. But the last, I would say, 18 months have been just explosive, right? I think one of the big things, um, the the reason agents have moved really fast is because uh, the ability of reasoning has really changed the game. Because if you really look at revenue cycle, a lot of the tasks are actually reasoning tasks of some kind. The reason we need experts is because we are reasoning on some information, whether that is a denial coming back and trying to understand the denial to see what is the next thing I should do and how do you approach it. Or when you're trying to send a prior authorization, understanding what clinicals are necessary based on the guidelines that the payer needs. They are all reasoning tasks and the agents and their ability to do reasoning has kind of completely exploded in the in the recent past. Actually. Interesting. So tell me more about that. Like how does this ability to do some reasoning how do, how do you see that you know in these ai agents transforming revenue cycle operations in the near future now that it has this kind of advanced capability yeah so the way i kind of think about it is that i think if you take a revenue cycle the, and you break it down into a series of tasks what we've done is we build a platform that orchestrates the entire process as a series of tasks mm-hmm. now if you take every task what you realize is there are two kinds of tasks. One is a very, what I call, simple reasoning task. Mm -hmm. It's high volume, uh, but low complexity. Okay. And then there are tasks which are high complexity reasoning tasks. Mm -hmm. You're trying to understand a very complex denial, or you're trying to understand how modifiers work in a certain scenario. So what we see is that today, you have to apply a lot of people just to do the low reason low the simple reasoning tasks because it's high volume Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of dollars tied to it but if you can take agents and apply agents to do those tasks now you suddenly free up a lot of team members who actually have a lot of domain expertise to work on complex things you can actually have higher yield on Mm. so the way we think about it is that everything that is going to have be simple reasoning um, is going to be automated in some shape or form there'll be an agent that does something associated to it. And these are going to be very task specific agents. And and the other interesting thing that we are seeing in the agent world is the ability to coordinate agents. So one of the things in the platform we're building is the ability for us to take one coordinating agent and have it actually associate work to two or three different agents that do specific work. As an example, you, you may say, oh, I want to do an initiation of authorization. Okay. So you could have an initiation agent But that agent might say, hey, here is an agent that actually initiates with United Healthcare. I'm going to hand off to it, which knows the United policies well. It knows how United deals with radiology, what kind of denials it gets, and is more attuned to taking the data correctly and submitting it to United. So you'll see coordination of agents come through, which kind of change the process mechanisms quite a bit. Wow. I mean, that's fascinating to have co- agents coordinating agents. That's a hard thing for a lot of people to process. But. Yes, it is. But but I think the platforms are going to allow us to do that. Yeah. 
That's really interesting. Yeah, one of the biggest frustrations in RCM right now has been really managing all the documentation that comes with authorizations, claims, denials. And AI is now helping now just not to read and sort the documents, but actually to take action. Can you share some actual use cases that show kind of this progression from just reading and sorting documents to actually taking action? Yeah. So I think even reading actually was a complex task. So we've actually been working in the intersection of kind of NLP and machine learning for reading documents. Mm -hmm. Now reading documents was easy if it's a structured uniform document okay. like uh, EOB as an sure. example. But a lot of practices and a lot of hospitals, what they get is these unstructured fax forms from the doctors with like handwritten things or check boxes. Mm. Very complex in the past. Now actually what AI has done is the ability to extract that information much easily. We are actually seeing very high, I would say success rate even with handwritten wow. documentation, which, which is the first step. Now combining the reasoning thing that I was talking about. So you take information, you get a document and this document is essentially an order with clinical information, mm -hmm. right? So it has two pieces to it. Now the AI agent looks at the data and says, okay, <clears throat> what did I get? I got an order, but I also got clinicals. Okay. So I got two things. So I need to be able to kind of process them separately. I need to take the order information and see if there is a patient record. If there's a patient record, create the order to the patient record. If there is no patient record, then actually create the patient record and create the order. So that's an action that you can actually take. Now that action can be taken either through APIs and fire inputs into Epic, okay. or it could actually be done through robotic process automation onto a portal, onto a EMR. So you can actually do it both ways, literally like a human would do. Now the second piece is a clinical document. You need to understand what clinical information is available. Is it relevant for the order and attach it. So now both of these show that you can not only extract the information, but also reason. We have done this for orders, we have done this for authorization forms, we have done this. We actually see a lot of 10, 10 to 15% of documentation that comes into physicians are junk. Wow. They're like flyers and other things. <laughs> and they, we just need to be able to identify them and sure. the agent is able to say, this doesn't apply to anything, put it to the side. Yeah. So, so we, we have 13 or 14 different types of documents we've actually kind of been able to not just identify the document, but actually then take action based on the document. Yeah, it's really interesting. It turns out fact spam is real. And fact we also spam need to real. address the people still on uh, written documentation. Yeah. But and, <laughs> and we have hundreds of people who are just processing these faxes into the MR. So think about in healthcare, we, we have two electronic systems, but communicating through faxes. Yeah. No, absolutely. And what kind of impact will these AI agents have on administrative efficiency and reducing bottlenecks? Talk about kind of the benefits of these agents. I, I think that there, so, so it starts with efficacy. So I believe one of the big things that these agents can do is actually improve efficacy. I think we always think about everything in the terms of efficiency, which is important. Okay. Efficiency comes only after efficacy. You need a certain amount of accuracy. I believe that in some of these repetitive tasks, actually humans have a lot of variation. As much as you teach them a smart person who's actually done it a long time, thinks that he knows better and kind of takes his own path, a newer person takes a different path. So there's a high degree of variation. That variation actually will reduce. The second thing is actually the speed to processing will completely change the game, right? Today, when an order comes in, we, this is another example of an order, right? So we have uh, physicians who actually kind of reach out to their patients and say, hey, um, can you send me the order, take a picture and send it to us while I'm on the call with you. But then when, once, once it comes in, a human has to read it, type it. <laughs> now you have an AI agent actually process it even before it comes in. So the person can have a conversation about scheduling, wow. find how close they are to this. The, so now you are actually maximizing the work but which, which an agent could do in the front office or a scheduling person because they don't have to worry about this incoming documentation. So you actually are starting to see this process where, where these agents will act as kind of force multipliers, which means that people can now focus on more complex tasks. Yeah, that's really interesting. And what an interesting workflow for them to be able to use the agent with. You know, you talk about efficacy, you talk about accuracy, you know, AI has come a long way in, in extracting and making sense of all this healthcare data, kind of like you talked about. 
but it hasn't always been perfect, right? It, it has its weaknesses. Can we really rely on AI in healthcare to be able to do this? Or, you know, how do you approach kind of making sure that we can trust it? Yeah, so I, I think the big thing to remember is that none of this is going to and I think there is this uh, fallacy that people have that think that you put an AI and all people disappear, right? I, I think the way I think about this is that you're going to actually now build a team that actually constantly monitors, manages, and evaluates the AI. So AI is not going to be unsupervised. We are not going to let it be unsupervised, especially in healthcare. What that means is that there'll be a team that actually looks at the results, does a QA of it, gives feedback back into the AI to actually continue to improve it. So there's going to be an entire life cycle built around the AI. It's not like traditional software where you just build, deploy and forget about it. This is going to be a constant evolution process. That's the only way we can rely. And accuracy is going to be a critical component of it. It's interesting, as you described that, we could have said the exact same thing about people. We implemented this new people process for RCM and we had to make sure it was perfect. Yeah. Like we never said that, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. We never said, oh, but like, in fact, we do the opposite. We audit the people to see how accurate they are. Correct, correct. We correct it, we monitor it. And if they're bad, then they don't do it anymore, right? Yeah. Like yeah. it's kind of the same thing. Correct. <laughs> but this now becomes far more targeted because the, the, the thing about AI is going to be that it actually, going back to the efficacy thing, it is going to be somewhat uniform in terms of its output. So it's, so so when you look at that output, you can say, okay, adjusting this uh, parameter makes it better. With people, it's slightly different because you know you don't know what their motivations are, biases are. Sure. The AI biases are something I think we can control. Yeah, that is interesting. You don't know if they had a bad day, they just had a breakup, Correct. whatever. Correct. But with AI, they don't have that issue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. At least not yet. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully we avoid that. So tell me, what were some of the tough, toughest challenges your team has had to solve to make the AI work reliably in RCM? Yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge in um, making AI work in RCM right now is to actually orchestrate it well with humans. Mm. I think um, the, the problem that we have today is that everybody sees what we have today and everybody sees the promised land but we don't know what the on-ramp looks to that promised land. The on-ramp to that promised land means that we actually have humans and machines working synchronously and parallelly. And that is going to be the critical challenge that we see because when you introduce a process and you put an AI into it, people in general still are not completely comfortable that, as you said, is it all correct or not? So they tend to over, I would say, analyze it, over evaluate it, Sometimes they think they can do better, so they take over, override it, right? So over-evaluation, overriding essentially becomes a challenge. We just have to get people comfortable that, hey, you, you deal with the complex problems and the exceptions, let the machine do it, and we'll have a QA process to look at it, right? So once we get that man-machine orchestration actually worked out well, I think we'll, we'll get better. Yeah. Well, it's a learning on both ends, right? It is. As you develop the product and the humans adapting to say, I can trust Correct. <laughs> Correct. And realizing that that actually frees them to do far more complex, high value cap uh, tasks because we still feel uh, to some degree threatened by it because mm. is it taking our jobs? Is it reducing the amount of work? What we don't realize, which I, I believe very strongly is that what it does is it frees up to do a lot of very high value things that we don't get to today because we don't have the bandwidth to do that. Yeah, that's really interesting. So what do you th see as next on the horizon? Where are you headed next? Yeah, so I, I think the big thing is uh, what we are, we, we, we are very focused on taking a use case approach or a, a task approach to AI. So what, what we, are, we are doing is we are breaking everything down into what what capability does the human still have to continue to do? What are agents, which tasks agents are good at? And what skills the agents need, right? So we are kind of breaking everything down into the kind of skills that agents need. Then our goal is to build out the skills, document understanding is a skill, understanding healthcare guidelines is a skill, being able to extract clinical information is a skill, 
being able to go on a portal and do the work is another skill. So these are different skills the way we think about them. So our goal is right now to solve as many skill problems as we can so we can actually make the agents really more efficacious. Because if we deploy agents and they don't have the right skills to do these tasks, I think we will not trust them and then of course it kind of falls back. So our goal is to kind of build these capabilities. Yeah, well then it goes back to the agent using this skill, this skill and this skill to solve a more complex absolutely, problem. Absolutely, I love that. Navaneeth, I always appreciate uh, you coming on the show to share your insights and perspectives, help educate us on, on what's really happening with AI and agents. Uh, it's always a pleasure, and thanks everyone for watching and listening. Okay. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com or search for Healthcare IT Today on your favorite podcasting applications. Thanks, Navaneeth. Thank you, John. Pleasure as always.